while Asian women were continuously characterized as sexual deviants who could not assimilate into American society, their sexual labor was exploited throughout Asia. The exotic and foreign backdrop, detached from civilized manners of behaving and religious dogma, allowed white colonizers and military personnel to create a sex paradise. An early example is from the French colonization of Southeast Asia, which they named Indochine. It was not a settlement colony, meaning very few French women migrated there. With the influx of French men, the sexual exploitation of local people was considered a necessary evil. Most colonizers routinely engaged in prostitution, since marriage with local women was not considered a respectable or viable option. They mostly took on concubines. Towards the end of the century, concubinage was considered a corrupting influence on the men, and thus the practice was banned. Prostitution then became a pillar of the colonial order. The term, gongai, literally meaning child girl, morphed from a neutral term in which you would refer to any child or young woman, to the referential concubine, and then the prostitute. This cultural transformation that turned all Vietnamese women into default prostitutes highlights how colonialism wasn't just about resource extraction, but about the rape and the humiliation of Asians as mere orifices to indulge in with little consequence. It was about domination in every aspect. Sexual subservience was not limited to women. During the 18th century, a visiting French official noticed a rising number of male prostitutes. Opium dens, a byproduct of the opium trade British colonizers forced upon Asia, facilitated more homosexual encounters as French colonists would opportunistically rape unconscious Vietnamese men. The allure of Vietnamese men was derived from their perceived femininity in contrast to Vietnamese women who painted their teeth black as a custom. Homosexuality was thus stigmatized as especially immoral, where previously it was treated with more cultural ambivalence. That's why stereotypes like the Rice Queen are just as damaging as the hypersexualization of Asian women. They go hand in hand. White imperialism in Asia after World War II echoed a lot of the same colonial sentiments. Despite the issue of comfort women under Japanese occupation being well publicized, comfort stations were not dismantled, but in fact, taken over by the US. Women's sexual labor was vital to US militarism and their lopsided alliance with South Korea. In 1958, 15% of Korean women worked as prostitutes. Bupyeong, Itaewon, Seoul, Busan, Dongducheon, and Songtan had camp towns built to service as many as 62,000 US soldiers by the 1960s. Most were former farming villages like Dongducheon, home to the largest camp town called Little Chicago, which had as many as 7,000 women working as prostitutes. These hubs were not only the harbingers of exploited women who were poor, war orphans and widows, whole industries evolved to also serve US soldiers, like restaurants, laundries, and stores. Ui Changbu initially had 10,000 residents who relied on just one silk mill, 
but by the 1960s, 60% of the now 65,000 people living there became dependent on U.S. military presence, while 2,000 women worked in cabarets or bars. Pimps, madams, and black market goods and weaponry became an important part of the economy. There were as many as 145 state-sanctioned prostitution districts in 1964. Exploited Korean women, however, were called the slur young gongju by locals, while the US viewed them as a corrupting influence on American men. The camp towns required women to be licensed, wear numbers, and be tested regularly for STDs, something the soldiers weren't even required to do. During this time, the parallels of prostitute to wife came to a head with the proliferation of war brides. Camptown women had little hope of returning to Korean society as their sexual respectability was considered tainted, and many sought to escape their desperate situations by marrying GIs. Initially seen as benign, a 1964 Time magazine article titled South Korea, a hooch is not a home, characterized all Korean women as gold diggers. 80% of these marriages ended in divorce. The story of Annie Park, a Eurasian who was raised in a camp town and abandoned by her white father, was also weaponized as a moral failing of Confucian concepts. She had been working as a prostitute since she was 16 and had had six abortions by the age of 19. The culture of prostitution was baked into the Korean-US alliance. The US Army in 1965 not only considered prostitution a constructive force, but justified turning the whole of Korea into a brothel by saying that it made troops more willing to fight in their Human Factors Research report. This idea was reinforced by Park chang huis presidential regime in the 1970s. Park's officials personally greeted women in the sex industry as dollar-earning patriots, praising them as critical to the economy and ambassadors of national defense. The legacy of prostitution persists in South Korea today, despite its criminalization in 2004. At one point, prostitution was alleged to have contributed 4% of South Korea's gross domestic product, which was equal to the amount made from fishing and agriculture. US bases are still the epicenters of trafficked women, as concluded by researchers in 2007. Although Korean women are much less involved in sex work today, juicy bars employing Russian and Filipino women facilitated even more illegal encounters between GIs and sex workers. They're gonna buy us a drink, and then they're gonna ask, can you go with me tonight? Or can we go to a date? Can we go to the hotel? Or can you do a hand job or a blow job? They always ask that when they came in the club. The American soldiers knew what they should ask for. Yeah, they know. The E6 entertainer visa often misleads women into prostitution as they are asked to send in a singing audition tape but are required to take an HIV test, which no other visa mandates. So yeah, this shady visa facilitates human trafficking. This system of sexual slavery was happening concurrently in much of Asia. GIs in the Philippines characterized Filipinas as little brown fucking machines powered by rice and bragged about them being as cheap to buy as a burger. Thailand, much like South Korea, built prostitution industries in the mid to late 60s to service 70,000 soldiers who at one point stopped for rest and recreation. The same policies were deployed during the Vietnam War. Vietnamese women were constantly characterized as primitive yet 
graceful, submissive, yet domineering, innocently juvenile, yet castrating whores. Orientalist stereotypes of the sexual saboteur justify white men's rape and torture of Vietnamese women, regardless of whether they were civilians or soldiers. One soldier witnessed three Vietnamese women being sexually tortured by the American Green Berets and Army of the Republic of Vietnam soldiers. Women also worked as hooch maids and prostitutes and were paid so little that even many of the lower ranked men who earned low wages could afford their services. These hypersexual images of Asian women remained so prevalent that when Vietnamese women soldiers visited the 1971 Indo-Chinese conference in Vancouver, a white lesbian asked if they were having sex with each other in the fields. By the end of the Vietnam War, there are one million widows and 200,000 prostitutes. As you've seen, the legacy of colonization, imperialism, and militarism has always been a white masculine venture, mired in the imagined sexuality of Asian women as objectified orifices and Asia as their literal brothel. The constant shifting between perpetual prostitute to temporary wife to whore to sex trafficking victim shows the space that we are allowed to occupy as not only as this insidious idea or stereotype or a thing of the past but a lived reality. Lone men aka sex pets on escapades to Asia are regularly known to target local women who are in a low social economic status or in poverty and engage in sex tourism, an industry still thriving. Harassment on dating sites provides a look into how we're racialized as sex objects and how white men feel entitled to our bodies. A 2002 study showed half of all torture and rape porn depicted Asian women as victims while a third depicted white male rapists. The enduring consequences of our history and now neo-colonialism in Asia are immeasurable. These harmful structures must be dismantled. It could be something as seemingly innocuous like cultural appropriation, in which white and non-Asian women don't ethnic dress in order to feed into the orientalist fetish and look sexy. This without having to experience the unique sexual and racialized harassment Asian women face. It could be the prostitution and human trafficking hubs happening in our own countries. While free the nipple and sexual liberation can be legitimate forms of empowerment, Asian feminism cannot be defined within the framework of white feminism. We can continue the woe is me lunchbox stories of our childhood or learning to accept ourselves as if the problem was all in our heads and not the pedestal of white beauty. Or we can make an open challenge to white imperialism because Orientalism is not just a stereotype.